any day that God steps into history, there can be either a great thing that comes from that, deliverance, or there can be judgment, or there can be both simultaneously. God is not limited by mankind and the way that our mind works and the way that we think. God is able to multitask. He can accomplish many different things at one time. And so last week, Kelly blessedly shared with us some really difficult stuff, but it was very true and needed to be said. Started, we started this study a few weeks ago talking about four different types of locusts who came in to destroy every single possible piece of vegetation that would have been in the land, and then that was followed closely by a drought. And through all of that, um, it seemed like the people began to be very, uh, they were mourning, they were, they were weeping, they were very sorrowful. But it seems to indicate by the way the Lord continues to speak through the prophet Joel that they had not yet realized the source of the problem. And today we want to talk about the source of the problem and then we want to move beyond that to the answer. Are you ready for the answer? Are you sure? Sometimes the answer hurts a little bit, but it's really good. It's really good. So we understand that there was sadness, great sorrow in mourning in the land. The farmers were upset because they no longer had crops and could no longer host harvest parties that they had become accustomed to hosting. They were known throughout the nation for holding these great parties that people would come to and indulge themselves in all of the great things that come from harvest time in any civilization. You have those who are priests who had been performing ritualistic sacrifices. Um, God gave Moses the instructions concerning the sacrificial offerings that needed to be made for the covering over, not the removal. That couldn't happen until much later when Jesus came, but the covering over of sin in the Old Testament. And so you see that as these things happened and unveiled themselves, that even the ability for people to be able to worship and to sacrifice the types of things that allowed God's presence to be in their midst, those things were removed as well. And for a while, it seems like that even the priests were bemoaning the facts that they were not able to eat because the offering was not only an offering to be given to God, but it was provision for themselves and for their families. They were able to eat of the meat and drink of the wine that was given for the sacrifice. And so we have this nation in devastation at a turning point, at a point where it seems like the only way that things can go is up from here. But then we read chapter 2 and we begin, as Kelly did last week, to uncover and unveil the fact that God wasn't finished yet with bringing destruction. There was another day of the Lord that was spoken of that was not just locusts this time, but it was a mighty army that would, be, that would descend upon the earth. And the army was to be led by the Lord's, the Lord, by Jesus, the captain of the army. And he, they were going to come to bring complete destruction, abject destruction to these people. How in the world do you find yourself in a place where even God is against you? Can you imagine? We should be able to imagine because all of us were born in this way. We were born in our sin, separated from God. We were at enmity with God. There was a division between us. We were separated from him and from his goodness and his holiness. I believe <clears throat> that the reason that the captain of the Lord's army was leading this heavenly army to bring destruction, and we don't know for sure all of the, the, uh, the revelation of this as far as in actuality, when this was to occur, how this was to occur, that's up to God. Sometimes he leaves us with questions instead of answers. You notice that? And so in this case, 
the Lord, the captain of the Lord's army is bringing this army. And I believe it's because the people, although they were devastated by the loss of income, the loss of influence, the loss of comfort, the loss of all of the things that we count as normal, normative, all of that was lost. And yet the one thing that they needed more than anything was the presence of God. You see, the condition of the nation, <clears throat> it appears, had gotten so bad that God was not no longer present among them. How many of us at times in our lives have gotten in our journey in places where it felt like at least that God was so far from us? Yeah, if we're honest, we'll say yes. So this morning, as we take a moment to dwell on that, that little area right there, I want us to think about the first commandment. Does everybody, anybody know what the first commandment is in the Ten Commandments? Maybe we need to do a study on the Ten Commandments. <laughs> I'm the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. My friends, God is a jealous God. And he does not glance at idolatry lightly. He's a holy God that deserves and requires all of our attention, all of our glory, all of our honor, all of our praise. We know this for a fact because when we're given glimpses of heaven throughout Scripture, what is it that they're reminding themselves of continuously? Worthy, holy, great is our God. I believe that even in our lives, that we have allowed, I have allowed idols to creep up and to take the place of God in parts of my life. Idols that seem like they're the fulfillment of the American dream. Idols that cause us to believe that somehow we've accomplished something ourselves outside of the grace of God. Idols that cause us to look in other places for comfort or for leisure. Idols that grab at our hearts and tear at our souls. Idols that are among us that are present at all times. Idols that we are required to do away with. So as we look at the passage today, we're going to read, we're going to see the character and nature of God. And he's given the people a pathway to avoiding the coming destruction. They did not, let me repeat, they did not have to go through what was about to come. There was a pathway that they could avoid and evade the coming punishment and judgment. And I'm telling you today, I want to give you hope this morning. I want to give all of us hope that there is a pathway for all of us to walk in freedom, to destroy, to knock down, to crush and kill the idols in our lives and to place on the very throne of our hearts our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And that, my friends, is where we find the place that we've been all been looking for all along. The title of today's message is Return to the Lord. Let's look at Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger 
and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the minister of the Lord, of the Lord weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Father, we pray today that you would open the eyes of our heart. We confess, Lord, that there are areas of our heart that we feel like that we've compartmentalized in such a way that you don't have to be the Lord of that area of our life. Father, we may not even recognize it. Lord, expose, just as the words that have been spoken here this morning, expose the hardness of our hearts. Open our eyes to areas and places where we have turned away from you and help us to return to the Lord our God. Father, I pray that today we would not hear words of condemnation, but we would be literally shaken by the conviction that comes from Holy Spirit and that we would be moved to change based on your character and your nature, who you are. Help us to love you more than we love ourselves and more than we love those things that are around us that we idolize. We thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Many of you are probably familiar with the story of Jonah in the Old Testament. I just want to recount a little bit of that story for those of you who might not be completely familiar. So God spoke to Jonah, and he told him to go to Nineveh. And he was going to go to Nineveh so that he could declare to them that God was getting ready to bring judgment. And Jonah did not like Nineveh. He did not like the Ninevites. He did not like what God had asked him to do. And so because of those three things, guess what he did? You know, he got on a boat and he sailed in the opposite direction towards a place that he was very familiar with, felt like home. But about halfway there, as he's on this ship, asleep in the bottom of the boat, the storm comes up on the water. Lightning is flashing, thunder is booming, and the waves begin to grow and beat against that ship to the point to where those who were on board began to question the fact that there must be something wrong with the gods. There must be a god that's angry somewhere. They began to search through the vessel to see if there's anyone among this group of sailors who could identify the reason for this crisis. And they've asked everyone, and nobody has a good answer or a good response until they remember there's a guy asleep in the bottom of the boat. And as he is awakened, they ask him, is, 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 are you the problem? Are, is your God mad at us? And basically he said to them, he's not mad at you. He's mad at me. <laughs> And so they took him up on the top of the ship and they told him, say something to your God. Get rid of this. Fix it. We're going to die. And Jonah said, the only way to fix it is for you to throw me overboard. They already feel like that God's angry with them. And so they question him again. Are you sure that's what we're supposed to do? They, the gods might get angrier if we throw you overboard. And he says, nope. That's what you need to do. And so they throw Jonah overboard, and almost immediately, reminding us of another story in a distant time, it's like somebody said, peace, be still. 
and the storm was gone. And so was Jonah. And he would have been really gone if it hadn't been for a great fish that came along and swallowed him whole. I've caught a lot of fish in my lifetime. I've caught a lot of big fish. And one thing I know for sure when I clean those fish is that I would never want to be in the belly of a fish. It is nasty, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All of the stuff that is partially digested on its way to being fully digested is in there. It's filled with acids. It's gross. It's nasty. And yet Jonah finds himself in the belly of a great fish. Some say it's a whale. I believe it was probably a Jew fish, which is, uh, uh, anyway, you might get that later. <laughs> Jonah was Jewish. Okay. There is such a thing as a Jew fish. I've caught, I, the biggest one I ever caught was 300 pounds. Uh, it's called, called a Goliath grouper. And I'm telling you, you know you have something on your, your line when you catch a 300 pound fish. But the good news is when I pulled the fish up, he didn't spit anybody out, right? <laughs> but that's three days in the belly of the whale, Jonah is there, somehow preserved in some kind of a bubble inside the intestinal stuff. And he finally cries out to the Lord and basically repents. I was wrong. And so God graciously causes some indigestion within the great fish and he spits Jonah up on the dry land. Wonder what else came up with him. We're not going to go there. Can you imagine what color Jonah's hair must have been at that point? How bleached his skin and maybe his clothing, if he had still had clothing on, were. But he was alive. And then God said the words to him that got him in trouble in the first place. I want you to go to Nineveh. So Jonah goes to Nineveh, and he said, the Lord tells him to say to them, in 40 days, God is going to destroy Nineveh. And he's like, this is a message I can get behind. I'll endorse this. And so he starts at the very outskirts of Nineveh with the first person, and somehow the news begins to travel like wildfire, like gossip. Oh, wait a minute. I mean prayer requests. I got to stop meddling. Okay. It begins to spread to where it even gets to the king. You know, the king's first response wasn't to arm himself for battle. It wasn't to try to show that somehow he was in control and that this, he didn't send out somebody to kill Jonah. He said, this nation has one will repent, will turn away from our wicked ways, and we will see if God will have mercy on us. And you know what happened? God had mercy on him. Jonah was still not happy, but that's for another time. We'll talk about that. People of Nineveh immediately respond with fear and respect. Even the king gets off his throne and he calls for the whole city to humble themselves, to turn from their evil ways. And, guess, and this is just a foreshadow of the type of repentance that God is looking for from each of us. So from the passage, let's start. God loves to give people a window of time to repent and return to him. Do you believe that? Are you thankful for that? God loves to do this. He loves to give people a moment of time, a window of time to repent and return to him. God is very dramatic sometimes in the way that he works, in the way that he affects lives. It's like, I don't know how many of you, what your testimony is of how you became aware of Jesus and how Jesus changed your life and transformed you, but I guarantee you that no two of your stories would be the, exactly the same because God is a very creative God and he will reach people wherever they're at, at their greatest point of need. So in the beginning of this passage in Joel, it says, yet even now, yet even now, he's just declared 
You've already had the locusts. You've seen the drought. The army of the Lord is coming with the King of kings and Lord of lords directing it. Yet, even now, it's not too late. You may think that your time has passed or you're, you've gone too far, but God said to the nation, and he says to us this morning, now. 2 Corinthians 6 says, working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, Now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And this echoes back to the Old Testament when the nation of Israel were given the same choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And and, and, and then as if to to answer the question, who will you serve? He says, choose life. Choose me. Today is the day of salvation. Sometimes I think when we think of repentance, it's kind of like how we treat other human beings when we've wronged them. So if we can get away with, I'm sorry, that's, that's what we try to get away with, right? Just an, I'm sorry, you know how I am, you know who I am, you get me. I mean, come on, Right? Are we really, are we going to, we're not going to do this, are we? We're good. Perhaps we walk down an aisle, we say a prayer, walk back to the seat, and everything is right. But true repentance is far more expensive than that. It's not an easy matter. Repentance is a change of mind. That's where it starts. We have to change our mind about our sin. We have to change our mind about ourselves. We have to change our mind about the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance is actually a very rugged process. Because when we truly repent of our sins, this is what's going to happen. Our mind will hate our sins. Our heart will despise our sins. And our will abandons our sins. That's what true repentance is all about. My friends, it's about change. It's about transformation. Jesus didn't come into your life just to make your life better. He came into your life to restore you to right relationship with his Father. So in this passage, as we move forward, God gives us the how-to of returning to him. Don't you like a good how-to? How many of you like to uh, search YouTube when you're getting ready to do a project? My family loves the fact that I embrace watching not just one YouTube video on how to do something, but every one that seems at all relevant. They especially love the ones that say 20 minutes. Those are their favorites. I just lied, and I apologize for that. I should not do that. They, they don't love that, actually. But God gives us the how-to. Return to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. True repentance starts with a broken heart. It has to start with a broken heart. This is a heart-rending a heart that is broken, something that gets into the the depths of our soul. This has to come from the heart, a broken heart, just as David declared in Psalm 51. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. We must be broken over the condition of our lives if we are ever to change. The nation of Israel did not need to be broken over their financial ruin or the fact that their reputation was going down or the fact that they didn't have the things, the accoutrements that they were used to and that they had observed 
when the blessing of the Lord was current and present. They needed to recognize their need for God, their need for change. We must acknowledge that our hearts at times are far from God. It's a hard thing for us to admit that we are wrong. Am I right? God isn't just wanting an acknowledgement of sin, but a recognition that our hearts are prone to wander away from God to other idols. There are so many other things that we look at deeply and intently, and we turn our ship's rudder toward those things, knowing the danger that lies beneath and around us. If we are to return to the Lord, we must first, we must first have a broken heart. The next thing is we must experience godly sorrow in order to be restored. It's not enough for us to be sorry that we ended up in a circumstance or situation. How many of you have ever disciplined your children and they said they were sorry, but you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt they were not sorry about what they had done? What were they sorry about? They were sorry because you busted them. By the way, parents, one of the great things about being filled with the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit can tell you things. It was not so great when I was a teenager. My dad was filled with the Spirit, and one night I came home, and he literally told me everything I had done. This was before cell phones. This was before any kind of GPS devices. This was before, you know, all of that stuff. But the Holy Spirit told him my evening's activities without my permission. You can imagine how how devastated I was that God knew everything too. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. It's not enough to say, I'm sorry. We must acknowledge that we have sinned against a holy God. And we must desire with all of our hearts for him to change us, to transform us, so we don't end up doing it again. Until we learn by the grace of God to hate what God hates and love what he loves, we will continue in this vicious cycle of having a facade of repentance that doesn't produce change. There have been many people throughout history who have worn the facade of religion and worn it much better than I do, and yet their hearts are, were far from God. They killed in the name of God. They raped in the name of God. They did all kinds of atrocities across history in the name of God, carrying a cross. What a shame. Religion is a counterfeit, is not the real thing. God is interested in real signs of repentance, not just a religious show. He says, rend your hearts and not your garments. It's one thing to rip your clothing uh, just as, as they would do in the Old Testament, to, to say that they were sorrowful, they were in a time of mourning, that something difficult had just happened. They had just become aware of losing something and being devastated by it. They would rip their clothes, they'd put on sackcloth and ashes, they would, they would fast, they would weep, they would mourn, they would be broken in spirit and in heart, most of the time. Sometimes it wasn't real, it seems. Because repentance is more than just an outward show. If we're not careful, the way that we handle spiritual matters can become a show. 
you don't believe me, just search the internet for people of God who have literally denied the faith and walked away within the last year. People that you would never believe in high positions of authority with lots of followers, ministry for years and years, who stand up one day and say, none of it was true. My friends, we who are of the Lord cannot curse the Lord and be okay. So God not only gives us the how, which is repentance, turning away, changing our mind, changing our heart, being brokenhearted and understanding the weight of the sin that we've committed. Then God gives us the why. Why should we return to him? After all, hasn't he just destroyed everything that we know? Hasn't he taken away from us everything that we feel like we deserve? Hasn't he touched every single area of our lives? Hasn't he said no to the things that we want to say yes to and yes to the things that we want to say no to? Hasn't he said to us, my child, my children, that is not who I am. He says, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and he relents over disaster. My friends, our God is not characterized by just judgment or justice. In his other hand, he holds firmly mercy beyond measure. The grace of God is what he gives us. It's his own ability that he gives us to do what we cannot do in our own strength. We cannot truly repent and walk away from our sin without the grace of God enabling us to do that. He also gives us mercy, and mercy is God choosing not to give us what we deserve. Have you ever thanked God for that? Instead of thanking him for what he's given you, have you ever thanked him for not giving you what you and I deserve, which is everlasting punishment away from the presence of God? This salvation that we embrace, this salvation that we talk about, this salvation that unfortunately can be a facade is much greater than just having a better life here on this earth. This is eternal. This is forever. We had a dear sister, Brenda Daniels, pass away this last week. After a faithful walk of endurance as she suffered greatly for the last three years or so. What a woman of God. What a tremendous example to all of us of somebody who could have easily cursed God and walked away, and yet she held tightly onto his hand through the whole process until she breathed her last in this life and opened her eyes to stare at him in the face and to see the eyes of mercy saying, welcome home, Brenda. Well done. I think that we are so engaged and distracted by everything that hits us every second of time. A buzz in our pocket, an earpiece that constantly speaks to us, a television that's on all of the time, a radio in the background or Bluetooth speakers playing somewhere, the boss at work requiring something that's going to require more time and effort. Your mind is flooded with all kinds of thoughts of anxiety and fear. This world is falling apart seam by seam, it's very easy to forget the most important things. How do I know? Because I have done it. God is gracious and merciful. 
Look at 2 Timothy 2 with me. Correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. What is it? God may give us grace for repentance. Oh God, that you might change us. That's a dangerous prayer. The next part of God's character that's displayed here is God is slow to anger. Thank God for this fact. God's justice is not based on rage or a sudden flash of anger. His justice is bent towards sin. He cannot stand in the presence of sin. He hates sin. We need to update our view of God. If your vision of God is some kind of celestial being, all radiant, holding a lightning bolt in one hand and a baseball bat in the other, waiting for you to mess up so he can strike you down, you need to update your vision of who God is. God is slow to anger. And when he's angry, he doesn't sin. You remember Jesus as he approached the temple area and there were the money changers who were using the place of God to profit. And what did Jesus do? Sudden anger came over him. He turned the tables over and what did he say? This house is called a house of prayer by my father. He changed it. He didn't just say, That's just who they are. That's their form of religion. And finally, God is abounding in steadfast love. I want you to just listen to the words from 1 John 4 as God describes himself to John, to us. So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. God describes himself in a lot of different ways throughout Scripture. We have all of the Jehovah's, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah, you know, you could list all of them. In the New Testament, here in the book of 1 John, I believe the primary characteristic of God is that God says, not that I love, God loves, but that God at his core, at his root, is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. God is love, my friends. If he is asking us to change, it's not just so that he can laugh at us or mock us. It's because he so loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What kind of love is this? You see, at the end of it all, God's God's heart desire is restored relationship with mankind. That's what this is all about. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. His desired outcome was not destruction. His desired outcome was restored relationship. He wanted the people to understand how bad things could be if he wasn't around. We know that God wants to restore relationships because he proved it to us by sending his only son, Jesus Christ, to live his life perfectly as an example of who our heavenly father is. He then poured out his wrath 
the Father poured out his wrath upon Jesus, the wrath that belonged on us because of our sin and the beating that we deserved, the mocking that was ours, the crucifixion that we should have experienced. Jesus took it upon himself to make a way for us to be made right with God. He proved that he was victorious in his rescue mission by being raised from the dead on the third day. And we who repent and believe on the Lord Jesus are given the Holy Spirit as a sign of being adopted into the family of God. This is good news, my friends. Good news. That's the great incentive for repentance, isn't it? The appeal to repentance and the prescription God gives are based on his marvelous, holy, omnipotent, gracious, loving, and kind character revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. We can truly say today that our God is a good God. Amen? In the end of this passage, God turns from the personal repentance and then he comes to the whole, to the group as a whole and says that the priests were to lead in this time of repentance and that they would repent for themselves individually, but then also for the nation as a whole. My friends, there are churches across this nation that need to repent as a whole. We need to walk in newness of life together. We need not to settle for what this world says is a, is a, uh, a doable way of, of following God. Religion is such a liar. We need to repent. If we truly, we cry out for revival, but we forget that revival begins with repentance. It begins with the turning away from the things that we have placed in the place of God in our lives, having to be right all of the time, judging people by the color of their skin, looking to drugs and alcohol to fill a void that only God can fill, hating our husband or our wife, looking at our children as blessings and curses. Allowing our minds to be flooded with all kinds of stuff as we look at our phones and look and look and look and look. My friends, the church as a whole in this nation has grown cold. And it is time for the fire to burn again. And I'm saying to you that I am committing within my life as one of the pastors of this church to lay aside the things that keep me from walking right beside, I should say right behind God, right with him. And I implore you, I beg of you, I beseech you that each of you would consider your ways and that you would ask the Lord to reveal any wicked area in your heart, in your mind, in your life, and that you would not grow content with it as if it were somehow that creepy uncle that everybody knows about, but they put up with. My friends, it's time to rise up. It's time to stop playing Christianity. It's time to shake the dust off of your Bibles and my Bible. It's time for us to find ourselves 
praying to God, and most importantly, listening to Him. It's time for worship to be on our lips. It's time for us to bless our families and not curse them. It's time for us to be concerned about the eternal destination of the homeless person that's in our way as we try to exit the grocery store. It's time for us to forget those things that are behind, to forgive those who have hurt us before and begin to pray that God would have mercy on their souls. It's time for the church to stop acting like something has happened in the past and it's going to happen in the future, but there's nothing happening in the present. My friends, God is not dead. He is alive and he is moving in the earth today. And I, for one, refuse to be of one who grows content with the accoutrements of religion. When my life, my heart, my mind is filled with things that don't glorify God. I cry out to him, change my heart, O God. Change my mind. If there's any wicked way in me, deliver me from it. Heal me, God, that I might be healed. Restore the joy of my salvation. My friends, this world should not be able to steal our joy the way that we're allowing it to steal it. We should be different. We are different. We're the people of God. Called by his name, set apart to display his glory in the earth today. But he's not going to move in us and through us if we're going to make a mockery of him by the way that we're living. We are not called to be perfect yet, but we are created to be perfect. And one day, as we continue to change day by day, day by day, day by day, transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, yielding to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us through the scriptures, through the preaching of the word, through worship, through strangers sometimes, through our children telling us truth. Over time, we begin to change. The things that we used to do repeatedly become less and less frequent. Before long, we're not looking at pornography anymore because our heart's desire is not for that. Our heart's desire is for our husband or for our wife or for the Lord if we're not married. Things begin to change, and before long, Jesus returns, and we are all made completely whole and new like we had never, ever been damaged by sin. Do not lay down in the journey We are like a person who has been concussed greatly and needs to be kept awake because the danger of falling asleep is too great. We must remain awake in this time, in this hour. Jesus is coming back soon. And I know that we could say, we've been saying that for 2,000 years, and yes, that's true, but if he isn't coming back sooner than he was 2,000 years ago, he's a liar. He will return. And will he find us? Commenting on a controversial post on Facebook. Because that's what fires us up. That's where our passion is found. Let the nations not say, where is their God? Let the nations not look at the church and say, where is their God? 
Let the nations not look at us and say, they're just like us. There's nothing different about them. Let's pray. We're going to have the worship team come back and just play that last song. I specifically feel this morning that allowing ourselves to remain offended, which leads to unforgiveness, is one of the things that we as Christians allow to happen. But it's not allowed by God. In the same way that we've been loved by God, in the same way that we've been forgiven by God, we are told and taught to love and forgive others. It does not mean that we don't acknowledge the fact that something was wrong that happened. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is looking at that and understanding that and yet still choosing to say, I forgive. What an amazing moment when Jesus wrote in the sand all of the people that had brought the woman to him caught in adultery. One by one, they dropped their rocks and they went home. And Jesus said to the woman, look at me. Look around. Where are your accusers? I don't know. And then Jesus, with the love and compassion and mercy that we talked about here this morning, looks at her and says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And on the wings of those words, that lady was transformed. She was given the grace that she needed to walk away from a life of torment, a life filled with abuse, misuse, a life that was destined for destruction. Just one word from God changed her forever. So I'm not going to tell you how to respond this morning, but I am asking you to respond. If you want to come down here and pray, we'd love to have you do that. If you want to stay in your chair and pray, the main thing I ask of you is that you don't check out right now. Don't check out. Spend this time with you and you and the Lord understanding that idols are not something that he looks at lightly. Ask him to reveal the idol of our hearts, the thing that we look to before we look to him. Security, financial wealth, good job, strength, human strength, whatever it is maybe intellect. Some people even look at the gifts that they've been given and idolize those above the God who gave them. So can we just get real for a few minutes here as we close this out today? I know that I did over the last few days. So I had a baby and I had some kind of way and the Lord dealt with me about some areas in my life that I had grown cold I had allowed myself to be entertained way too much by the things of this world rather than by the presence of God. So Lord, we give this time to you. These next few moments, whatever you want to do, Lord, we leave it in your hands. Father, I pray for those who might be here or be watching this online who are not yet 
followers of Jesus Christ, Lord, they find themselves in a place that the Old Testament speaks of. They were without hope until Jesus came. Lord, we thank you that even this day that you'll grant the gift of repentance to those who do not yet know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. We pray for salvation right now in Jesus' name. And for those of us, Lord, who know you and yet we have allowed the things of this world to cloud our desire for you to, to take away our hope to challenge us in the area of faith to steal our joy. Father, we pray that you would change us this day, that you would begin the process of renewing in us a right spirit, creating within us a clean heart. Clean us up, Lord. And Lord, we cry out not just for us, Lord, we understand this is a generational situation. We pray for our children, our grandchildren. We pray, Lord God, that they would see the real Jesus for themselves, that we would be an example to them of what it looks like to follow Jesus, especially when things are difficult and when they make no sense and when we're hurting and broken because that's the place where we find refuge. Thank you, Lord, that you send the great fish to swallow us in our times when we put ourselves in harm's way. You protect us. You give us a chance. You give us a window of time to repent. And the Lord, we say that today is the day of salvation. And so we come to you the best we know how. We ask you for more. Thank you.